It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Larry Lasseur from the CBS News staff and August Hexer, chief editorial writer for the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Charles E. Saltzman, Under Secretary of State. The State Department has been going through a series of shake-ups, big and little, for as far back as this reporter can remember. And this year is no exception. But for a change, this time, the most recent investigation has aimed, it seems to me, at building up the morale of the State Department, and our guest tonight has been in charge of carrying out his recommendations. So we'd like to ask Mr. Salzman, just what was the situation as you found it when you came into this job? I came into this job just after the, uh, the so-called Riston Committee, the Secretary of State's pu Public Committee on Personnel, had made its report and the Secretary of State had adopted its fundamental recommendations. And at that time, recruiting at the bottom of the Foreign Service Officer Corps had, had uh, dried up almost to, uh, to, to nothing. And the, although the responsibilities of the State Department since World War II had increased enormously, and it had, had to uh, bear the brunt of, of the Cold War on behalf of the United States, uh, the Foreign Service Officer Corps had not only had not grown, it had, it had gotten smaller. In, in, the last two or three years. And the Riston Committee, uh, Mr. Salzman, had made recommendations for re remedying this situation? Yes, they had. The Riston Committee had made recommendations for, for uh, integrating into the Foreign Service Officer Corps the other people in the State Department who were doing the same kind of work as Foreign Service officers, uh, one third of whom were in Washington and not subject to uh, serving anywhere in the world like Foreign Service officers. The other third uh, were abroad like foreign service officers, but administered under a, an entirely different system, uh, so that you had three different groups doing the same thing. Well, one couldn't, one group couldn't go into the jobs of the other group. Uh, I take it the foreign service is sort of the core d'elite of the State Department, isn't it? And everybody tried to get in that, but couldn't get into it. Well, they, they, that's right. Yes. Uh, did you find the uh, the foreign service to be full of the, the sort of people we see in the stereotype? Uh, what are called cookie pushers, people who have lived so long abroad that they've forgotten what America is like? And no, I, not at all. I, I think that idea, if it ever was, uh, was appropriate, uh, uh, ceased to be appropriate many years ago. Well, actually, didn't you find that some of the members of the Foreign Service were a little bit too, too Europeanized and had been too long out of the country to know America well anymore? I think that is certainly true. Uh, when the Riston Committee made its report, only 125 out of 1,200 in some Foreign Service officers were on duty in the United States. That means about about 10 percent. In other words, Foreign Service officers as a, as a group were practically in exile, and very few of them had had any considerable amount of service in the United States at all. Well, but there have been some complaints, Mr. Saltzman, that the uh, State Department is full of people who only wear stipe, striped pants. I think that stems from a sort, rather an Ivy League tradition that you had to be a member of the Ivy League colleges of Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, or at least an Easterner to get into the State Department. Now, is this true under your new uh, program? One of the major recommendations of the Riston Committee, uh, which was adopted by the Secretary, was that recruiting be in future uh, on a uh, regional basis or state basis, so that the recruits will represent more completely and proportionately all parts of the country. You didn't have to be an Ivy Leaguer, but there was a, preponderant, uh, a disproportionate uh, number of people from the Eastern Coast and from the Eastern Colleges. Do you believe that you can build up a democratic foreign service, a, a democratic in the, in the sense of uh, a foreign service that really is open to all people, regardless of their, of their uh, financial uh, background or, or their educational advantages? Yes, I do, particularly if, the, uh, if uh, Congress supports us in the scholarship program which was recommended by the Secretary's Public Committee. What is that, uh, Mr. That was a proposal that there be uh, 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 organized a system of scholarships competitive in nature and given on a, on a regional or a state basis where 
uh, young men and women who've done well in their first two years in college would get a scholarship from the State Department for their last two years, provided they agreed to uh, uh, compete for, for positions in the Foreign Service upon graduation and agreed to serve not less than six years after graduation. Does this mean that uh, anybody who is going to college now could possibly get into this uh, scholarship course to get into the Foreign Service? They, they possibly could, yes. And does this mean also, I take it, that there could be women ambassadors as well as men ambassadors? Yes, but that's there true is, now. There is one, yes. In Switzerland, isn't there? Yes. Well, actually, uh, Mr. Salzman, oh. what about our foreign servicemen and their ability to become ambassadors? Isn't it true, nevertheless, that uh, it takes a position of wealth or a large contribution to campaign funds to become an ambassador to a large country like the Court of St. James or to Paris? Can we ever get around that, or is that a part of the American dynamics? Well, uh, traditionally, or by custom, the, the largest posts have been filled uh, by political appointees, usually ones who had ample means because the, uh, to do the job properly takes a lot of money. However, at the present time, about two-thirds of our missions are headed by career foreign service officers, and that's a figure which has been increasing steadily. Mr. Saucman, you are, I think, in charge of security in the State Department. Yes, I right? am. You have uh, overall responsibility for the, uh, the firings in the State Department on security grounds? Yes. Uh, has that problem caused uh, difficulties in morale since you've been there? I don't think there's any doubt that the security program, which uh, 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 resulted from exec the executive order of the president issued in 1953 and which applied to all the executive departments was a blow to morale while it was going on because it required a, a complete recheck of all people occupying sensitive positions on the, on security uh, from the security point of view and secretary of state quite rightly uh, decided that all the people in the state department w would be deemed to be occupying sensitive positions Therefore, all of our people, or 11,000 American employees, had to be rechecked. I'm glad to say that's practically over now, but while it was going on, it undo undoubtedly was disquieting to the personnel. Mr. Salzman, uh, I think the public is a little bit confused on the difference between uh, a question of loyalty and a question of security. I certainly am confused. I wonder if you'd explain the difference between loyalty and security when it comes under question. Well, loyalty has to do to, with, with, with loyalty or disloyalty to the United States. Uh, a person could be a security risk without being disloyal. If I'm an employee and I'm a, an habitual drunk and I have to do with, with uh, uh, confidential and classified matters, I think you, you might find I'm a security risk, though I might never have dreamt of being disloyal to the United States. So in your program, you really don't have to seek or prove disloyalty in any way, do you? No. Well, is this the first time that the, this sort of man has been weeded out of the State Department, surely? There must have been some uh, questions of people's aptitudes and abilities before the Richmond Committee was established. Oh, of course there has. Uh, the State Department as an employer has been like most employers, I suppose, since, uh, since it was first organized, and people have been weeded out because they were unsuitable for their job but uh, through the years. Wouldn't it be better, though, just to, just to fire a man as a drunk and not uh, confuse the issue by calling him a security risk? I don't know. I think you have to have an order about security risks. Well, Mr. Salzman, uh, isn't it a fact that uh, since the State Department has been a whipping boy for the, a number of years now by politicians that morale has been damaged now? Has it been damaged irreparably? Certainly not. I'm sure of that. The, uh, when I came in the State Department, I'd heard a lot of talk, as everyone else has, about morale being bad. I don't believe the morale is bad. Uh, I'm quite sure it isn't in the headquarters in Washington because I, I'm there most of the time. I've just come back from visiting nine of our posts abroad in Europe and North Africa, where I saw a great many of our people in groups and individually. Uh, on the whole, I'm sure that the morale is generally very good. Well, uh, I wonder uh, if it's possible for our Foreign Service men to report uh, to the State Department in Washington as accurately as they feel they should report without uh, falling into the position of being thought to be traitors because they weren't reporting what the politicians at home wanted to hear. Now, does your uh, new program take care of that sort of thing? Danger, isn't it? Well, our new, new program didn't have occasion to address itself directly to that, but I, 
I am sure that uh, uh, the judgment at the, at the Washington end is not based on what people might want to hear, and I have every confidence that our Foreign Service people abroad have enough character to report the things as they see them. But are you rewarding initiative and courage, both physical and moral? As it, are, you, are, you giving, uh, are you promoting people faster in proportion as they are independent and show this initiative? Yes, I think so, because our promotion is on a, a selection basis on, on merit, and uh, the people who show the most merit, including the people who do the, the most uh, uh, accurate and careful reporting, are more apt to be promoted than ones who don't. Mr. Salzman, we're in for a long haul now. We presume that the Cold War will be of long duration. Do you think the State Department and its men who are in the forefront of the Cold War and the struggle for our lives are uh, fit for this battle of our lives? Yes, I do. I think they're a splendid group of men and women. I think if this, uh, if this program that uh, uh, the Secretary has uh, directed be carried out is carried out promptly and effectively, as I'm sure it will be, they'll be even better. Uh, it's uh, obvious to everyone that the State Department must be as effective as it possibly can in the Cold War, because the Cold War is essentially a State Department war. Uh, this program will, will or give it a better personnel organization and a better personnel management for that purpose. Mr. Sultan, I don't know if you have any uh, sons, but if you did, uh, would you encourage them to go into the Foreign Service? Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. Because they, you think they would be rewarded and they, in service and with promotions, possibly? I think they would, uh, particularly if the things now planned are put into effect. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Salson. It's very kind of you to come up from Washington to talk to us about this. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and August Heckscher. Our distinguished guest was Charles E. Saltzman, Under Secretary of State. To watchmakers of the old school, such as Longines, pride of workmanship is a traditional attribute of every detail of every operation. In a watch in truth, the smallest cog is just as important as the biggest wheel. Pride of workmanship made Longines the world's most honored watch. Honored at world's fairs by 10 grand prizes and 28 gold medals. Honored at government observatories with countless prizes and citations for accuracy. Honored as official watch by sports and contest associations the world over. For all who have an appreciation of the fine and the beautiful, the pride of workmanship so evident in every Longines watch makes an irresistible appeal. Our particular message at this time is an important one. If you're planning the purchase of a watch as an important Christmas gift, and you want to give just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, your choice might well be Longines, the world's most honored watch. And do you know, that there are many beautiful Longines watches for ladies and gentlemen priced as low as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Wetnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines, Wetnor watches.